But uh, yeah, good afternoon. I'm excited to preach today. And like Pastor Susie uh, shared, I'm going to be preaching on the third installment, uh, just, just uh, finishing off this short sermon series on John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer. So uh, let's get straight into it. Um, I don't have it up uh, for, uh, the, on the screen for you guys to read. So if you guys can get out your Bibles or your phones, uh, that would be great. And turn to John chapter 17. And we're going to be reading verses 20 to 26. John chapter 17, 20 to 26. As you turn there, uh, just give me about 10 seconds to get situated. All right. Because this podium is kind of short. <laughs> All right, John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. We are continuing to eavesdrop with the disciples and listen in on the, on the prayer of our Lord, on the prayer of Jesus. And I'm just going to be reading this. Please follow along from the, from the ESV. <clears throat> Jesus prays, I do not ask for these only but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we desire to grow in prayer not just knowing how to pray, but we want to pray according to your heart. So at this time, as we study your word, and as we read John 17 and listen in on your prayer, Jesus, I pray that we would feel your heart. I pray that as we are even apart right now in our own rooms or wherever we are watching, I pray, Lord, would you encounter us? We want to We posture our hearts, Lord. We posture our minds in a way where we expect to hear from you. We expect to engage with you. And we expect to tap into your heart today. So bless us, Lord, that we would bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Question I would like to start off with is, what is something that you have experienced that was so great that you so badly wanted others to experience as well? Let me ask again. What's something that you experienced that was so great that you longed for somebody else to experience that as well? If you know me, I love food. I love going around Korea eating good food. And if you know me, you will know what I will say when I eat something really good. I oftentimes go to my friends, I go to Pastor David Ha, and he goes, what would you do yesterday, man? And I said, oh, I ate at this place called Majang Shijang, man, the Hanu meat. And then I'm like, bro, bro, you got to go, man. I got to take you. I got to take you. Every time I eat something really good, there's something about me where I enjoy it so much, I just want other people to enjoy it as well. And then I finally take them, and I'm watching them eat. And when they put that meat in their mouth and chew, 
in my inner being, I'm like, right, right, right? It's good, right? And when I see them enjoying what I also enjoy, there's something that just I experience. This is joy I experience. Whether it's food or even movies. There are certain movies when you're talking with certain people and you're like, yo, have you seen that movie? And they're like, no, I haven't seen it. And you're like, what? You haven't seen Nacho Libre? You, you haven't seen Nacho Libre? How, how can... Yo, let's watch it. Let's watch it right now. Let's watch it next week. And there's something about when we enjoy a movie, yes, I love Nacho Libre, that when we, when we just want somebody else to enjoy and laugh with you together, there's an enjoyment that you have together. Another example that I like to share is there's this famous board game that I love. It's called Settlers of Catan. I love playing Settlers of Catan. And there was this one time where we were all playing. It was getting really, really popular at our church. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, now fiance, Pauline, she never played this game before. And there's one time where, you know, like, yo, you got to play with us. You got to play. And then I so wanted her to really enjoy the game. As the game is progressing, as the game is progressing, I'm looking at her, her face and demeanor, and I'm like, oh, man, she doesn't like this game. This, is, this game is boring. Uh, it's, it feels nerdy. Like, what is this? <clears throat> and then something happens. What happens? The first time she plays the game, she wins. She wins, and then she goes crazy. She starts jumping up and down, and she's like, you know, and then I, I just delight in seeing her delight in the things that I delight in, and we get to delight in it together. It's a great example, right? All this to say, there is a joy that is experienced when we witness someone enjoy the things that we enjoy. There is a joy when we have a shared experience of delight together. All of us can relate. My examples may be silly, but all of us can relate uh, to some degree. You know, in a greater way, we bring so much joy to God. We bring so much joy to Jesus when we delight in the things that he delights in. As we dive into this passage, I pray that we would experience just even a little bit more, that we would experience the longings of Jesus' heart, that we would catch that, and that in the way we live, in the way we respond to the, de to the de desires of his heart, that that would bring so much joy to him. That's what I pray today. So the passage begins here. It says in verse 20, Jesus says, Father, I do not ask for these only. I don't ask for these things only. What are these things? And just to recap a little bit for the uh, first two sermons of this series, what are these things that he asked? And I preached the first message. Pastor Susie preached the second message. The first thing that he asked was, Father, the time has come. I ask you to glorify your son. As in display to the world the fullest extent, the fullest extent of who I am by lifting me up, by glorifying me, but on a cross. What, another thing that he asked, that we would have eternal life. And he says, eternal life is that we would know him intimately. So he prays for himself. He says, glorify your son. He desires eternal life for us. And third, he asks, and he prays for his 11 disciples. He prays, Lord, Father, protect them. Protect them as I leave and as you send your Holy Spirit. Protect these disciples. Keep them in your name, he says, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. And Jesus proceeds and says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them safe from the evil one. So protection for the disciples. And then he prays, Father, sanctify them in your word sanctify them in your truth let them be more kingdom centered 
than be drawn away to be more worldly. So he prays these things. I do not ask you, Father, for these things only. And he proceeds and prays this. But also, also, I pray for those who will believe in me through the word, through the sharing of the gospel. Those who will believe in me, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So John 17, he prays for himself. He prays for those disciples. And then he prays for future believers. He prays for future followers of Christ. He prays for me. He prays for you. Jesus had us in mind. He prays for what? Specifically, that we would be one. He prays for the unity of all believers. That word unity is such a special word. I believe that every human being, the way that we're wired, the way that we're made, there is such a high value and a natural longing for unity is built into us. I believe that all of us have a longing for connection. All of us have a longing for intimacy, for oneness, for union, for encouragement, for mutual edification. All these things that point to the fact that deep in our hearts we were made for unity. Whether it's in games, in sports, in our families, in our communities, in all our relationships, we all seek and desire unity because we were all made for relationships. And I think this is fascinating because this, this really points to the fact that the reason why we desire unity in relationship is because you and I, we are made in the image of God. And God, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, He is perfect unity. He is perfect relationship. And because we are made in His image, we are made for unity. There's such beauty in union. Union. I think of the word reunion, reunion, when you haven't seen your loved ones for a long time and finally you get to connect once again. You miss them so much and you have a reunion and there's such a beautiful experience when that happens. That's what Jesus is looking forward to actually when he's praying this. He's looking forward to the reunion as it goes back to the right hand of the Father, into the same intimacy and fellowship he once had before all creation. When I think of union, I think of marriage. I think of marriage. When you think about our family members who have gotten married, our friends who have gotten married, when you see them at the, at the altar and they say their vows and they make a covenant before God, it is such a sacred act of union, of oneness. Marriage, but also think the idea of reunification of North and South Korea. When you see the stories of siblings and family members that have been separated because of the war, when you see those videos and those YouTube clips of brother and sister coming back together at the border just to hug just to reunite once again. There's something that happens in our hearts as human beings because we are made to desire unity and union. When Jesus prays for unity, that we would be one, he's not praying for a humanistic unity. He's not praying for a humanistic unity. He's not merely praying that we would get along. 
He's not praying for a unity where we will become one in mind, but compromise the truth, but compromise the gospel. The example of that, that I think of in the Bible is in Genesis 11. It says that they were, the people were gathered together at the Tower of Babel. And the Bible says that they had one mind, one speech, one language. They were one in thought, one in their goals. They were unified. There was unity there. But because of sin, it was unity without godliness. It was unity without the fear of God. It was a humanistic unity. There is a godly unity that Jesus desires for us. A godly unity. Where God desires oneness of brothers and sisters in Christ unto oneness with God. That is a godly unity. Especially in this day and age, the word solidarity, solidarity is such a, a hot topic word. It's another word for unity, isn't it? You know, solidarity with fellow human beings for righteousness, for justice sake. Solidarity with fellow human beings is needed and it's great. But the moment that solidarity is not centered on godliness and we compromise what we believe in and what the Bible says and who God is, we have begun to stray from a righteous unity but have turned to a humanistic unity which, as we see in Genesis 11, it results in the Tower of Babel being built and God begins to scatter them. When Jesus prays that we would be one, it says in here that in turn, that we would represent who God is to the world. The world is looking for the people of God to show them what true godly unity looks like. The way that we love one another, church, the way that we love one another and the way that we live in unity, it matters big time to God. This is like the last prayer that Jesus is interceding before he hangs on the cross. This matters big time to God. What a desire. What a prayer. What a goal. What a prayer that we should be praying in agreement with. And I do want to say that there's a big difference between unity and uniformity. Uniformity versus unity. I want to quote Charles Spurgeon. He says, Those who are quite uniform may yet have no love to each other, while those who differ wild, widely may still be truly intensely one. Our children are not uniform, but they make one family. Our children are not uniform, but they make one family. Which means this. There is diversity in the kingdom of God. Not everyone has to look the same. Because in Revelations, in the Bible, in the end time, what it's going to look like, is, it says this. It says every tribe, every nation, every tongue will be worshiping God. Every knee will bow unto him. The kingdom of God is diverse, but there is no compromise of the truth. There is no compromise of holiness. Every tribe and every nation. Amen. And then what I believe in John 17 as the climax of this chapter, the climax prayer and longing. When I read this, you can't help but feel the longing of Jesus here. I think when I read this passage, I feel like the emotions of Jesus is most expressed when he's praying this part. When the disciples are watching him pray and just listening and eavesdropping on him talking to the Father, this is the part where I believe that the disciples are like, wow, like he really, really 
wants this. He really wants this. Or he says, Father, I desire that they may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. He's saying, Father, the longing of my heart, the desire of my heart is not just that they would be saved from the flames of hell. The longing of my heart is not just that they would be delivered from their sins. Father, the longing of my heart is that they would be with me where I am. That they would experience the glory, the goodness, the perfect intimacy, unhindered fellowship, that they would experience what I have experienced with you, Father. I want them to be with me where I am. You see, when we align our lives to that, and when we begin to pray those things, there's so much joy that is experienced in God. Jesus is excited as he's praying this. He's both in agony because he has to go to the cross, but he's also excited to return back home to, his, to be with his father. But he's not only excited to be back with his father, his heart longs for us to join him. He longs for us to join him. The same intimacy before the foundation of the world, Jesus desires for us. To what point? To the point of death. How badly you want something is revealed by how much you're willing to pay the cost. Silly example, how badly I want to, you know, marry Pauline. I will pay some money to buy a ring. <laughs> okay, silly example. Till so, you know, there's a hole in my pocket, you know? <laughs> Sorry. <All right. laughs> but, you know, for Jesus, how badly he desires for you and I to experience what he has experienced. We all know the cost that he paid. The holes in his hands, the crown on his head, that glory is displayed on the cross. He desires this so badly that he's willing to hang on the cross. When we pray, when you and I pray, brothers and sisters, and we start our, pr start our prayers, Father, I desire blank. Father, I desire blank. I'll be the first to admit that it doesn't look like this prayer. Father, I desire that coronavirus will be, you know, done away with. Father, I desire that we can get back together again to worship. Father, I desire legitimate things, great things. But as I read this and I feel the ache of the heart of Christ, I'm believing more and more that our supreme longing and prayer that the Father loves to answer is when we pray, Father, I desire to be with you where you are. I desire your glory. I desire your presence. I desire to know you and be one with you. How do you feel like? How do you, what, how do you think the Father feels when we pray that prayer? Father, I just want to be with you where you are. The joy that is released in the Father's heart. Could you imagine? You know that song that we sing a lot, all I want is just to know your heart. And would you keep me here until we're one? You know that song, all I want is just to know your heart. Would you keep me here until we're one? And it says after that, just a little while longer until I see you. Just a little while longer till I know you. Just a little while longer until we will be together. 
I've sang this so many times. But I just realized that every time I'm singing this song, I'm praying John 17. We're praying the prayer of Jesus. All I want is just to know your heart, eternal life. Would you keep me here until we're one? If the longing of God is unity, then Satan will not just sit there and watch. Satan will attack. He will use sin to bring about disunity and division. Division and divorce is not from God. Disunity in the church is not from God. Racism, tribalism, classism is not from God. These things are a work of the enemy. Sin divides and love unifies. How would Satan bring disunity? By the way you and I view fellow human beings. By the way we view one another. Comparison. All of us, by the way, fall short of this to some degree. Comparison. Jealousy. Envy. Injustice, pride, greed, malice, coveting, murder, selfishness, gossiping, a condescending view of one another, etc. The Bible lists out all these sins, and every single one of these sin, sins manifests division. Every single one of these sins is another lash lashing upon the body of Christ once again. These things that originate in the heart, these sins that, manif that originate in the heart, when Satan attacks, these things manifest into racism. What we see in society today, tribalism, classism, division, all these things. Where there is disunity and division, it's a direct sin issue. It's a sin issue. It's a heart issue. The sin of others and the sin of ourselves, which means this. The only cure to this disease, the only cure to disunity and the heartache that we see all around us today, the only cure is the gospel cure. Only the gospel cure impact where there is an abundance of forgiveness grace humility can cultivate unity how do we bring joy to the father we pursue unity only the gospel can do that in our hearts the gospel transforms the way that we see one another the way that we talk about one another the way we see ourselves where we don't elevate ourselves with the way we treat one another, and the way that we feel toward one another, the gospel heals us of our view of fellow image bearers of God. One cannot live in disunity and truly be a growing gospel believer. You can't. The gospel utterly humbles us to the point where it transforms the way we see people that are different than us. Why? Because the gospel gives us a new identity. Because our supreme identity is a citizen of the kingdom of God. Where the culture and values of Jesus himself manifest itself in unity. Otherwise, more often than not, we will slip into a humanistic unity. We need supernatural intervention unity is a supernatural endeavor it's a supernatural endeavor we can't help the way we grew up we can't help these things the only way is that we humble ourselves before god before the living god confess this about ourselves repent of these ways 
And in a heart that is poor in spirit, ask the Lord, Lord, manifest yourself in me. Change my heart. Change my heart, God. John 17. Let's zoom out a little bit. John 17, the sequence of this prayer is this. Jesus is praying in this prayer that we would have union with God. You remember earlier in the first sermon, it says that they, may, that, that they may know eternal life. And eternal life is this, that they would know God. Intimacy. Jesus is praying that we would have union with God. And then he's praying that we would have union with one another. Because there's going to be future believers now. The body of Christ is expanding. And then he's praying, this is really important, that as a collective body, there would be a collective union with God himself. Which means this, is not just about unity individually with God. God's dream is so much bigger than that. Christianity is not about, it's not an individual Christianity. It's a collective Christianity. It's not just union with God that God wants. It's union with one another in Christ unto union with God together. That is a dream of God's heart. That is a dream of God's heart. Now, just because I preach this and we learn this does not mean that the next day, all of a sudden, we will see one another differently. It takes time. The Holy Spirit, the glory that he has given us, is helping us. I think of Peter himself. When he just began to follow Christ, do you guys remember, as a Jew himself, he got it. He got it. And then he began to fellowship with people that are different than him. He began to sit at a table feasting together with Gentiles. People that he was so not used to eating with. And they're eating together. And then all of a sudden, his Jewish friends comes. James's crew comes. And he sees that the Jewish crew comes. And then all of a sudden, knee-jerk reaction, what does he do? He bounces. He steps away from the Gentile table. And then Paul rebukes him. What are you doing? You're a gospel believer. Even Peter himself. There needed some time. Where the heart of unity would manifest in him. If we're honest with ourselves, we're much like Peter here in that example. We're associating people that are different than us. We have our prejudices. We have our ways, sinful ways that we've been brought up. We have condescending views of people that, you know what I mean? Like, we're more like Peter in that way. But I want to encourage you that when Jesus prays, here's the great news. When Jesus prays this, how many of you guys know when Jesus prays? It's not wishful thinking. When Jesus prays, it's going to happen. Which means this, John 17 is not only a prayer, it's a prophecy. The oneness of all people, of all believers in Christ, we're all going to be one with him. So if you're discouraged, God, why can't I love? God, why can't I see certain people in this way and this way? Friends, like take heart. Jesus intercedes for you and I. He intercedes for you and I. I want to call our attention and remind us of the vision of our church. New Philly, the vision of our church, we haven't talked about it in a while, but we, pre we preached a sermon series on it a couple of months ago. The vision of our church is calling all to the feast. Calling all to the feast. And under that vision, there were three pillars. It was to feast on the Lord. Second was to invite others to the feast, the Great Commission. And third, it was to look forward 
to the feast of all feasts with an end time mindset. If you don't know, please go back to our other sermons, but we will be talking about it again soon. Why am I reminding us of this vision? Man, as I was reading this passage, my mind was getting blown because the vision of our church, I could see it so saturated in the prayer of Jesus here. Calling all to the feast. When Jesus prays, that first pillar, that when Jesus prays that they may know him, that they may know us, that is eternal life. That covers our first pillar. Feasting on the Lord. Jesus made a way that we, would, that we would feast on the Lord. And the second pillar is inviting others to the feast. You know, and that's union and unity with one another. That future believers would be one. And then lastly, a collective union with God and an enjoyment of Him together. And what we learned today here, Father, I desire that they future believers, would be one and that they collectively will be with us where we are. Tasting and seeing the goodness of God, inviting others to the feast and looking forward to the feast of all feasts, the wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 7. This is a prayer, like I said, but this will be answered. Because as Jesus is praying this, can you just imagine with me what he's envisioning? What is his dream? What is his hope? He's not just looking forward to 2020, that we would be one. He's looking forward to the time when he comes back. When Jesus comes back, you know what he will find. You know what's going to happen. He prophesied it himself. In fact, we will be one. We will be one. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. I'm looking forward to the day where in this way, in a horizontal way, guess what? We're going to have such a deep love for one another without any hindrance, without any prejudice, without any struggle. We're going to be so filled with love for one another like it's, we can't even conceive it right now. We're going to experience that together. But at the same time, we're going to experience perfect fellowship and perfect intimacy. The same intimacy that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit experienced before creation. We're going to be experiencing that for all eternity. That is eternal life. This is the dream of his heart. John 17. John 17. Yeah. You know, this concludes, this concludes this sermon series. And I want to take some time to pray, actually. Um, what I feel like, what I feel that the Lord is, you know, highlighting to me personally. I want to share an uh, illustration, actually, that... Uh, the Lord spoke to me personally, and even through studying this passage, I believe it's for our church as well. Uh, there was a time when uh, I woke up earlier this week, and uh, I was so thirsty. I was so thirsty. I was parched. I didn't drink the water the night before. And I woke up, and I didn't drink water right when I woke up. Some of us, we have a habit of doing that too, right? What did I do? I opened the fridge. I got out my coffee and I drank the coffee and I was like oh it's so good I need my coffee fix I went to the office for work and then I got out another glass of coffee and I drank coffee and I was like oh I need this caffeine I need this energy and then I sat there thinking wow I didn't drink any water you know those moments for all you non-water drinkers like oh I didn't drink water today and then I sat there and I felt like God was uh, speaking to me through that. I had memories of, um, I would make excuses, stupid excuses. I would tell my friends, hey, um, I don't need to drink water. Why? There's, there's water in coffee. 
So when I drink coffee, I'm drinking water. There's water in coffee. It makes sense, right? No? Yeah. That was my, like, like, stupid logic. I was just making an excuse. I know it wasn't true. I'm not that dumb, okay? But I was just saying that. But God was bringing that to memory. And I realized that in the same way, oh, there's water in coffee. I don't need to drink water. That's how I was treating um, church events. That's how I was treating my job as a pastor. Where we need water to survive. We need fellowship and intimacy and drinking from the well of life to survive. But my mindset was, but the water is in the coffee. There's Bible reading in my job. There's Bible reading in my house church. Oh, I'm listening to the Bible when I'm sitting in Sunday service. There's water in the coffee. How many of you guys know that when you just keep drinking coffee, you get addicted to the caffeine, to the energy that it just gives, but you're not drinking water? And I found myself confessing to God, God, I am addicted to what these events provide for me. But I realized deep in my heart, I am thirsty. I'm not connecting with you, God. I think I am, but I'm really not. Um, I don't know if anyone can resonate, but I feel that as we can't gather together anymore because of corona and whatever season of life you're in, I just want to say that this passage, hear the heart of Jesus. Let him be the living water that you drink from rather than depending on the good things. Coffee is good, by the way. Rather than depending on the house churches and, and, and the Sunday services and the K-1s and all these things. These things help. But on your own, connect with God. Because here in John 17, it says, Father, I desire that they may be one and that they may be one with me, that they would know me. That's my prayer for our church.